work for the telephone company. And I'm from a little town called Lake Isabella. It's about, oh, it's about an hour east of Bakersfield, if you ever heard of it. Um, never thought that I would be in ag. I mean, we just, I joined FFA and I did that and got out of, um, got out of high school, joined the army. Did that for 12 years, a couple government sponsored trips to the Middle East. And um, in the meantime, I was going to school at Davis and I had taken a job for a peach cannery, clean peach cannery. And I thought, you know, this is pretty cool. It was, um, it was just, it was interesting. Um, so then I went to Davis and I was studying to be a wildlife biologist and it just, it didn't fit. You know, I grew up in a small town and um, important work ethic and I just kept on finding myself going back to ag jobs. And I got offered a, a job doing operations on a, on a, about a 5,000 acre rice farm. And um, so that was, I really enjoyed it. And um, so I was farming, driving tractors. I kind of got bored of it. Um, it was just the same thing year after year after year. And my, my mentor that's, um, I'm taking over for in this current position asked me, he heard me talking about it one day, personal um, relationship and said, why don't you come um, take a look at what we do in the strawberry industry? And I'm like, okay, you know, what are we gonna do? You know, we're gonna grow for, you know, grow plants. I didn't understand how it, how it all worked. And so I started working for him and um, is the role to come into this position as general manager in sales and it's it's fascinating to me because I was telling some of you this earlier as a kid that grew up in a little town of about 2,000 people I never thought I'd have a passport going beyond Bakersfield we I had family in Santa Maria that was like a big trip and now I have a passport I've been to Spain Morocco um, Central Mexico, up and down the coast, Baja, uh, traveling the world fairly frequently for this business that, you know, I never thought I would have done. It's so much more complicated and, and the opportunities that you can get involved in in the industry are, are, are fascinating. And you don't have to have a, a background in it. You don't, your family doesn't have to have 10,000 acres, um, especially in the, in, the, in the fruit industry. You can kind of start anywhere and it'll take you wherever you want to go. And it's, there's some great opportunities out there. Um, we're heading into a really challenging time for the strawberry industry. Um, there's several governmental issues that are, that are putting a pinch on us. There's market forces um, it's gonna be a pretty wild five to ten years I'd say I don't think there's a lot of people out there that are kind of wondering what this thing looks like um, and there's always a need for talent probably um, as I was relating to some folks earlier you know the rice business it was the same thing year after year the old people you know the older generation the family farms they had the farms they had the money and that's where it stood you have such a huge influx and opportunity uh, and amount of opportunities in the fruit industry versus anything else I've farmed or been involved I've been involved in the dairy industry, the killing peach industry, rice industry, and this one is by far the, the most interesting and um, the most rapidly changing industry that I've been involved in is in the ag sector. So, so anyhow, uh, the sh I'm going to blow through some of this. Does uh, real quick hands? Does anybody know like variety? Like what a UC variety is? What a grower that grows UC variety is versus a Driscoll's grower or a Plant Sciences BGI well pick grower? Does anybody? Okay, we'll get into that a little bit. Okay. So these are the nine nurseries. There's there's nine nurseries in California. Um, Plant Sciences grows primar primarily um, varieties for a company called Berry Genetics, and they're packed through like the well-picked label. Driscoll's is Driscoll's. Everybody's, you know, that's every family, friends, everybody I say, you know, I grow strawberry plants, they say, oh, you must grow from Driscoll's. No, well, we do, but it's not the only thing we do. Sierra Cascade Nursery, they grow University of California varieties and they contract for Driscoll's. Lassen is primarily growing for university varieties. Cedar Point's primarily uh, university varieties. We do some contract for Driscoll's, but we are primarily University of California varieties. Planasa is a Spanish company that grows University of California varieties as well as their own proprietary varieties that is open source material that you can pay to grow. Um, Jacobson Pacific Ag and Cal Nursery. Um, Cal Nursery grows um, some university varieties. Jacobson Pacific Ag primarily grows from plant sciences. I know that's a lot there, but there's all these affiliations that go and most of it's tied to what company do you ship your berries through? You know, whether it's Well Pick, whether it's Driscoll's or Foxy, you know, they've got their own label that's Blazer Wilkinson, a different company. They mainly use um, California varieties. So why, why is that important? That's the, that's the thing I think 
because a lot of people in the class won't understand this. Why do we care if it's a university variety or a Driscoll variety or a, a Lassen Canyon variety of plant sciences? Why does it matter? I'm just buying it. So it, can I just buy a Driscoll variety? You can. It's it's access. So it's 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 a proprietary variety. Like Driscoll's is a proprietary variety, and their model is a little different. I sell plants. Driscoll's doesn't sell plants. They lease you the plants. You grow the you grow the plants. They get the fruit. It's a contract. You can't halfway through your Driscoll's contract say, "Well, I'm going to go ship through a different sh shipper." It doesn't work that way. You can't grow a Driscoll's variety unless you're on a contract with Driscoll's. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not certain how how. Um, the BGI plant sciences stuff works. I know that they have growers that have both university varieties and um, and BGI varieties in their field, and they ship that through the well-picked label. So when you say university varieties? Primarily University of California. There's also University of Florida varieties that we use in California, but the, the open source material that is by far the majority used in California is um, the University of Varieties. University varieties were developed at the University of California, um, primarily by two breeders, Doug Shaw and Kirk Larson. Um, they're no longer with the university. Um, they have a new breeder there that's starting to introduce material into the marketplace right now. Okay. But anybody can grow those varieties. Right? Anybody can grow those varieties. You can walk up to our nursery and say, hey, I want a box of Monterey, and I'm going to sell you a box of Monterey, and then I'm going to charge you a royalty on it that I return back to the university. That's how all this is funded. Um, as far as from the university and from like Planasa, as they get varieties, they charge you to use them. They're going to sell you, the nursery is going to sell you the plant. And then the nursery is going to charge you $10, $20 per thousand plants. Whatever that royalty structure is, they return that back to the breeding program. That's how the breeding program gets their money out of it. Go ahead. Sorry. I want to take you off point, but industry, you're starting to get these club varieties like in New Zealand and stuff where you're literally, the growers are paying on a per box of these. Yep. You're not going there, there's all sorts of different, like you take some varieties and you go to Mexico and you have to be in a club and the shipper has to be in a club. So like California Giant or, um, or A&W, they have to be in that club for you to access those varieties. Um, there are some of these, Planasa has some where it's a fruit royalty. So every, and Well Pick does the same thing. Every, um, or Plant Sciences does, excuse me. Every time you sell an $8 flat of strawberries or whatever that flat price is, you got to to return 25 cents back to the um, to the to the breeder. They are doing the same thing, and it's tough because in a $20 market, 25% you know, big deal. In a $6 market, return a, a quarter per tray, you know, it starts to it starts to hurt. So, this is fall planted acreage for winter strawberry or. Um, uh, for production, and this is all the districts. Are you guys familiar with, like Gerald was just talking about, we had the Oxnard districts down south, Santa Maria, Watsonville, San Joaquin's really, that's kind of a you pick or a farmer market. They're really, they're not even growing strawberries right now. So this is the 2019 numbers, um, 25,704 acres. You can see there's definitely a downward trend in the California strawberry industry primarily because of the varieties that we have available to us actually outproduce the market right now. We hit two record weeks in June of last year of nine and a half million trays picked. Uh, first week of June and second week of June last year. And um, so we're starting to see a correction in the market right now is what we're seeing. Um, so there's, the next slide is summer planted acreage for fall production. So, so by far the majority of the plant or the berry production we have in, in California is all fall planted acres. These are plants that are shipped down beginning about the third to last week of September. And that starts in the Oxnard area and it goes all the way up to, to Watsonville and we finish there about the first week in November. That's by far the majority. 
those are all plants that are going to start producing fruit beginning in Oxnard. You're going to start seeing fruit coming out about the first of the year. They're really going to hit their stride for the Valentine's Day pull around Valentine's Day, and they're going to go through Easter, depending on when it is, and usually go into the process market sometime in May or June. Then Santa Maria comes in, and then Watsonville area comes in. So everybody kind of, in an ideal year, they kind of enjoy their own market space as we move through the year. But I wanted to, I brought that up just so you, we have a, between the fall planted and the summer, or the, so the summer planted acres is a little different. Those are plants that are planted um, this time of year, going into about the first week of July in Santa Maria and Oxnard, um, with the idea being those plants are going to be into fruit in September, October, November, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to take advantage of a market window and get some fruit on the market before the newly planted production comes in. So last year we had 31,714 total acres in California, and these are pretty around planting numbers, but I'm going to say 20,000 plants the acre, um, 634, 280,000 plants, and a rough plant price of around 140 bucks a thousand. So our industry is probably worth around $89 million. Masa Menos, you know, some of these, the planted acreage, the planting densities will change, price per plants change, um, but that's kind of, that gives you an idea of what, of what the, just the nursery industry does. So I took this picture. This is a couple front terrace when that fruit variety was first released out of a field in Oxnard, beautiful berries. Um, and this is what every strawberry grower wants to see is beautiful plants like the, or fruit like this that comes out of a field. This was, I think, during the Valentine's Day pull three years ago. So that's just gorgeous. Stem berries, you're going to make a lot of money with that. This is where we think you need to start with and what we're looking for. Two really nice plants, good thick crown size. Um, a lot of uh, feeder roots on them. They're going to go down, they're going to hit the ground, they're not going to stall, and they're going to start growing plants. I mean, uh, growing berries. So, this is a little non linear. Um, we got two different things that I'm going to try and describe here. How we take a and make a plant, the whole four year process it takes to make plants, and then where we do it. So, the first thing that we we start at is with our lower generation, our generational one level material, and that's done at our Manteca, our nurseries, which are usually located around Manteca or Turlock area. And I'm saying things like usually because not all the nurseries are in the same exact area. We're located in Red Bluff. There's another one that's in Redding, which is up in Tehama County. We're all kind of spread out, but I'm just trying to catch the far majority of stuff. So. For stuff, for, for plants that were planted this last fall, we started the process in June of 2015. Um, so the first thing we do is, in our, is, is adjacent to our laboratory facilities, we'll take a single plant of one variety, we'll put her in a pot and we're going to hang her. And we just hang her in a, in a greenhouse, and then we'll do that with two of each variety that we have in our nursery. And so she goes throughout the whole growing season, and she's dropping daughters off. Everybody's familiar with how strawberries propagate. They send out a runner. You get a daughter plant off of that that goes down. Okay. So that goes all the way through the full year. And um, excuse me. Let me back up a second. Okay, so yeah, so we hang our nuclear mothers in this instance of around June 2015. And then that plant grows, she sets off daughters. In November, and, between November and December of 2015, what we do is we start removing those, those daughter plants off of that nuclear mother. We take them into the laboratory, we remove the apical meristem, and we put that in a, um, in a media to grow plants. Strawberries are done through clonal propagation, right? Because it's an octoploid. You can't use seeds to propagate them. It's got to be through for the refrigerated propagation. Um, so. And I, yeah, I've got a picture of one. I'll show it. It's, um, so those mare stems are cut, put in the media in, in uh, November, December of 2015. We grow those out. We take them out, we remove them, we put them in a little pot, um, and then we plant them in a greenhouse environment um, in about May. 
We sample them for virus under the CDFA's certification program to make sure that they don't have any viruses. And then in January 2016, we harvest them. So it's almost a full year to produce this, what it, this, this clean material. This is what we call a clean plant program. Almost every nursery does this. The idea being if you've gone through this whole entire system, um, you're going to have zero viruses because you're at 100% virus indexing and you're going to have the plants are grown in, in isolation and that so your nursery stock that you're going to begin to begin to begin to blow up into larger numbers is going to be completely clean material. What well, you didn't do this material loaded with virus what's, what's the flip side? The, the The flip side is that you get multi-generational material and as and a couple things, exposure equals disease. The longer it's out in the field, the longer it's out in the environment, you could pick up disease and and have a, and be giving your sick plants to your growers. The other thing that happens is meristemine actually rejuvenates the plant. It reintroduces reintroduce, re vigor back in the variety. If you get down to G8, you know, generation 9, 10, the plant actually loses vigor and um, it won't be, the fruit will downsize, it'll be smaller and you won't have the, the best nursery stock you can give to your fruit growers. Um, so I just walked through all this. So this is what our, our greenhouse looks like. So these are the mothers up here and then they're, they've got the daughters that are cascading down. And that's a daughter right there. So then what we're going to do is we take them into the lab environment under a dissecting microscope. We're going to cut that daughter beginning at the base. Some people going from the top, it's just a technique. Some people going from the base. And we're moving that little speck of tissue right there. And we're going to be putting it into a test tube with a media in it. Grow those out for a couple months. They get larger. We pot them out, and then they go to a screenhouse environment. Each one of these bins represents a different variety, and then we come in and harvest them and bag them up. So now we have pure stock, generation high vigor stock, to go to our next level, which is our G2. And this is, it's similar in that. Um, we're not dealing with a whole lot of plants. We've got about, a, you know, maybe from one of those plants, we created anywhere between 100 to 500 plants. It depends on the variety. Um, and so the, the idea that, you know, we're, the, it's multiplication every time. So one goes to 100. And then that 100 is going to go, you know, it's going to be a multiple. As they go through the generations, they actually lose a little vigor. So that same plant that did 1 to 100 is going to do 1 to 90 the next time, or 1 to 80. Um, so again, we're testing with a CDFA certification program and now this is going to be, it's not going to be 100% virus indexing, we're doing 10% virus indexing, which means the state's going to come in, they're going to collect leaf samples from 10% of the plants in that block, send it off to their lab, look for disease, and then hopefully you get a pass. If you don't get a pass, you have to destroy that cultivar. I mean, not that cultivar, excuse me, but that foundation block. Um, so those are planted in May of 2016 in this case, and then in January of 2017, we're going to harvest them. And this is done, and this is a low elevation field that we have outside of um, Red Bluff, California, where we're headquartered. Um, go through, we chop the tops off of them, hit them with a hay rake, go through with what's called a trommel digger. It digs the plants, pins it through that trommel, knocks all the dirt off, and then we throw it in a box and save it again for next year. So now we're at May 2017 and we're going to and we're going to plant our increase block. Again, this is at low elevation down in the Manteca, Turlock, Central Valley area. Um, so we've got a couple of different pipelines here that's happening because this is eventually going to be our um, our stock for our high elevation nursery, but we also have a, a, a second business here where we start selling plants to other nurseries, either in Mexico, the European Union, um, particularly in Spain, and also in Canada. So we have to start doing things like we have to inspect them for export to, to the European Union and Mexico, which means we have to have government officials, in Mexico's case, come up from Mexico, we tour them their field, we pay, the nurseries have to pay for it to get to this permit, and then they, they inspect the, 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 the true to type and the health of the field, 
um, and then allow us to have an import permit into Mexico. European Union's not it's the same, but not similar. What happens is um, the county official, county ag official, come out and walk these fields every three. Or excuse me, they'll do three walks over the summer. They're looking for the same thing: any virus, any diseases, to allow us to import into the European Union. Um, so in January 2018, we're going to harvest that increase block and we're going to get some plant sales off of this and then the rest of it we're going to hold until uh, May, April, May, when we're going to plant our high elevation nursery. So this is a field outside of Merced, California. Um, that's when the field starts to fill. So it goes from this. This is what a field looks like when you first plant it. You've got these little mother plants throughout the field. Spacing is about well, one plant every eh, 14 to 16 inches on a two row bed. And this is pro picture is probably taken sometime in August. The beds start to fill in, but that one daughter produced all this, or that one mother plant produced all this plant material. Um, this is a field right before it's harvested. You can see it's started to change into dormancy. The, the leaves start to senesce. That's how you can tell when a, a field's ready. They get this nice deep dark red color. The plants are senescing and starting to shut down and make a, a hardier transplant. And again, we come through with these trommel diggers, dig up the plants, put them in bins, and um, we take them to our sorting facility. And I'll show some of that later. So now we've gone up to our, which our G4 is our commercial pipeline, or commercial timeline. This is where, these are the plants that are eventually gonna end up in the fruiting fields. So we're planting um, this, the nursery right now, as a matter of fact, we started on Monday. It's funny because right here it's 70 degrees and it's nice, I was talking to our production manager this morning. It's 30, snow's blowing sideways. Um, it's, he sent a picture of him on skis last night screwing around. It's pretty, it's pretty gnarly like that, but it's like that every year. You know, it's nice and you know, warm down here and it's blowing snow and terrible up in the nursery. Um, so this is, um, so we're planting this now and this is located up in the Butte Valley, which is right on the Oregon, California border. Um, almost all of the, uh, plants that are grown for the California nursery or California fruit production come out of this one little valley and the reason is it's cold. The, the trick to having a good strong transplant is cold, is chill. So this is a kind of a geographical oddity, this valley, and it has some of the coldest temperatures in the months of September. So again, when it's warm down here, it's gonna be freezing up there. What that does is that causes that plant to senesce and, and, and harden off so that we can dig it, box it, and send it down here for a fresh transplant. So, so our growing season begins in April, it goes through May, June, um, September and then, um, where do I have that in there, huh? Um, and then we're digging in, we're digging those in September, November for like the market I described earlier. We're sending the plants down here beginning of the third week of September. So we're gonna fill our orders for California and then, um, you know, hopefully we won't have anything left over in the field. It does happen, but ideally you don't. Oh, this is what I was trying to show. So the high elevation nurseries, that's primarily McDole is where most of them come. There's a nursery, Madras Schools has a small nursery in the town of MacArthur. Most of that's going to Florida. And then Sierra Cascade has a nursery outside of Susanville. And again, I think a bunch of that goes to Florida. Because um, California nurseries also do service the Florida market to a, to a degree. And this is what the high elevation nursery looks like. This is us planting a couple years ago. Um, we'll just plant through the snow. If the, if the planting shoes can get through the ice, that's fine. Um, we do something that's a little unique There's uh, versus other nurseries. We use a tunnel culture, tunnel culture system. And um, so we're 100% we're on drip in our nursery. Um, and it's just a matter of, of opinion. Some, some nurseries like to use overhead irrigation, so they have sprinkler pipe out in their field. We use 100% drip and then we use this tunnel culture system. And what, what we think it does for us is early in the season when it's snowing, I mean, we'll get snow up there in June. We got six inches of snow in June 14th, two years ago. 
it's essentially making a small greenhouse over these plants. Um, it gives us a jump on the season, um, increases our yield, and um, you know, just farming yields the the number we all worry about, right? And this is what 80 acres of tunnels look like up in up in that valley. And they're and looking out towards Mount Shasta. And this is a row of mother plants inside the tunnel culture. Plants as they get bigger. The only problem with it is the weeds like it too. So you're trying to weed through these through these tunnels and it's gnarly because how do you see, you know you can't see from the outside so you're sending hand crews through to do this and the labor can be pretty daunting on this so as we begin and then what we'll do is about the middle of june we'll start opening and slashing the plastic vent the plants and then we'll take every we'll have usually have all of the plastic off by the fourth of july that's, we're going through, and throughout the season, the growing season, we're going through, we're weeding, picking off uh, flowers, trying to get the, the reason we pick off flowers is for two reasons. We're trying to get the plant to not flower. We want it to grow plants. We don't really care about the fruit. Um, and the other thing is, is the more fruit and flower you have in that field, the more opportunity you have for disease. If you got a bunch of rotten fruit in the field, you're gonna pick up Botrytis. Um, there's, a, so, uh, some thought out there that if you have flowers out there, you're gonna have more insects. More insects is a potential vector for disease. Uh, so that's a field again, that nice red color right before we harvest. It's one of our digging crews. And what we're doing is we're digging in these bins. And then these bins, we haul each, all these bins down to our trim shed down in Red Bluff where we do all this hand sorting. So all this plant material is just thrown on these tables. And what they're doing is they're going through and they're sorting the bad plants from the good plants. We'll operate three of these and we'll have about 600 employees during our peak season in the middle of October. <laughs> every, every time I give this presentation, I gotta deal with that guy. So this is what they're, this is the actual, this is all paid on piece rate. So it's just trying to keep them apart? Yeah, because it just, because when those plants grow, the, the roots interlock, and so you just have this mass. So you're sitting there, you have to pay people to pull it out, look at the plant, is it a good plant, is it too small, does it have the root system that's enough, that's developed enough, and then put it in those bunches there and then pack it. Um, does everybody know what piece rate is? Piece rate? And hopefully your plants look something like that when you send them down to a fruit grower and they get fruit like that and you don't get your butt chewed for sending them bad plants. Um, so the other rules of the nursery, so that's, that's the growing process. Um, the, the nurseries have a few other roles that we take on. I think I kind of hit on one of them. Is we work with breeding programs to introduce new varieties in the marketplace. Um, especially now that the University of California has taken a, due to some legal issues, and uh, if anybody wants to talk about that, we can, but um, the University of California had a changeover with some of their breeders. So there's a huge vacuum in the California market right now for new varieties. So you've got a number of different breeding programs that are trying to introduce varieties into the state right now. Um, and so we work with those breeding programs to propagate, send their trial down material, material down to growers, growers can look at it. And then we also do follow up with consulting on the varieties and try and, and pick what's the new hot variety that's, is, that everybody wants. So we, that's University of California, Planasa, University of Florida, FNM, which is a Spanish company. Um, CIV, an Italian company. And then we also have a role in IP protection and royalties. So if you spend, the, the to get a strawberry plant from a seedling to an actual commercial variety takes years and years of work. Um, we work with the University of Florida and their seedling program takes up about 10 acres and it's got about 23,000 seedlings in their program that they have to evaluate. Um, so you see something that looks good and it looks kind of interesting, you take that and you take that seedling next year and you propagate it out and you get a few plants. 
and then you send two of those plants to Florida to look at, to see what they look like in a fruiting field. And okay, it kind of looks interesting. So you take those eight plants you have left over and you blow that up into something. And you just do this process and sometimes it can take years, five, six, seven, eight years. So there's a great deal of expense and, um, and time involved in that, breeders, and it's, it's, it's quite consuming. So the way they get their money out of that is through, through royalties, and I think I explained that earlier. So every time you sell a plant, or 10,000 plants, or a fruit royalty, that's how the, um, that's how the breeders get their, get their cut of it, um, and when it makes sense for them to do. And it's critically important, because varieties come, varieties go, um, you're always looking for something, the, the new hot thing. You know, what's going to work in a different environment as a variety tires out, um, you know, what's, what's going to work. Uh, I threw that in there, Imco Cal, they're a company that specializes just in royalties. Uh, when these breeding programs move internationally, it's pretty daunting because every country has a different um, level of protection for intellectual property. Everybody's probably heard of China and how they don't respect intellectual property. Um, when it comes to plant stuff, it's pretty tricky because like the EU has a completely different view on IP protection when it comes to plant stuff than the United States does. So what about Morocco or what about Ethiopia? How do you, in these countries that don't respect IP, how do you control your varieties? So what you have to do is you have to hire a company that has foreign agricultural specialists that can go out and figure out how do I put a scheme in place in say Morocco or in Ethiopia or in Spain to ensure that my that my um, intellectual property is protected and that um, and then I get a return on it because otherwise you know once your variety gets out forget it it's you know all over the place if, if the country does not respect uh, patent rights so um. Oh, this is, I just kind of want to end on this. So this is, this is one of the partners of our company. This is Javier Venegas. He came over from Mexico in 1977 and was Crown's first employee. Um, this is what I always, why, one of the cool things I think about the strawberry industry is Javier started as just a, a farm worker in the field. And uh, just through hard work and, and determination and knowing his business, like I said, he's, he's going to retire probably in the next few years, but is. Uh, been with Crown the whole entire time and you know he's going to retire as a owner of a company. I think that's kind of a that's a unique story that you don't see in very many industries very often. So I just thought it was kind of interesting. He's a great guy. So that's all I got. And I think I'm pretty well ahead of time. So does anybody have any questions or questions? Yeah, hopefully I didn't bore you guys. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, in terms of like when you're starting with the mother plant, how many um, dollar plants are produced from that one mother plant through all of those generations? So like that are essentially from that one. So I'll use Monterey as an example. We we shipped we shipped probably thirty million Monterey in two thousand nineteen. We started probably with four Maris stems in 2015. So it's pretty substantial. I mean, we get, you get down into some of these fields, the low elevation nurseries, and they have a chance. You know, that plant is actively growing from when we plant from about the third week of May all the way until January, February. We'll get, plant, we'll get fields that will yield 600 to 700,000 plants per acre. It's, it's pretty impressive what, what the plants will do. It's, it's pretty impressive. And then the plants, essentially, you dig those plants up. Once they're planted, then they get pulled apart. Yep. Yeah, they get pulled up, and then they go to the, nether, ne the next nursery, and that's, you know, that's the whole idea. Is that it takes about a, it's a, it's a three or four year process to get to where you can produce a commercial plant. It takes that long. So that's why that's why, you know, part of my job is trying to understand what does the what what does the market look like right now? How much Monterey are going to, as a variety? Monterey is a variety. How much Monterey are we going to have next year? How much San Andreas are we going to have? How much Fronteras? So as we plant the nurseries now, these fruit growers just started picking fruit. It's been raining, as you guys know, all winter long. 
they don't know. They haven't picked a flat of strawberries yet, but I'm down here because I got to plant my nursery trying to understand what they want to do next fall. So there's a lot of just going around, talking to growers, trying to understand what the industry looks. What varieties did they have last year that they may not be like so much this year? What, what, how's the weather affected that? And then get an idea of what we're going to plant our nursery to make sure that they have enough plants to plant their fields next year. Now you take that back and you say, well, it took you four years. So we've got to start thinking about this. We get an idea of what, you know, what does it look like in four years? So if we see a variety that's a trial variety or something and we go, you know, that looks pretty interesting. We better blow that in the, in the nursery to see what it's going to do. And it, it may be a you know, wrong-headed bed. It may not be. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's a lot of just trying to understand, understand the industry, understand the market, and do your best not to screw something up, because you will. It's just it's the nature of the beast. I was, on a, I, was going to, I was going to a conference in Florida, and I ran to a guy. He had a, he had a, a pecan nursery logo on his bag, and he started talking. I'm like, oh, I'm in the nursery business, too. And he was talking about a new type of propagation they were using. And I said, it doesn't matter. He always says, it'll, be, it'll give us a cleaner tree. He goes, it doesn't matter, because you're going to screw them up eventually. And even if you don't, you're going to get blamed for it. And he goes, yeah, you are in the nursery business, because that's kind of the what we always you know, joke about, is everybody blames us for everything. So it's, you got to have broad shoulders in this business. So, yeah. Mike? Um, what about the conditions of the Central Valley are like, more favorable than coastal California for nursery production? Like, why not do all your production with fruit growing? Um, a couple reasons. We get a, little, we get a bit of a longer growing season, um, warmer temperatures. Warm temperatures, good for plants, bad for fruit. Um, those hot days where it's 100 degrees, those plants crews they really do they like it it gives us a longer growing season the other thing is is we don't want to have nurseries right next to our fruiting fields because of disease issues um, you know if we put those right next to each other now we have strawberry plants that are being grown 365 days a year so now you've got a harbor for cyclamen cyclamen mite and all sorts of other plant pathogens that just hang around on a crop you know it's like when you see a guy that's got second year strawberry plants right next to a guy that's you know just planting annually you know it's pretty tough for that guy that's planting annually because he's doing all the right things and if there's a guy that's ha holding over second year plants you know it's the same issue they're harboring all sorts of disease insects and ligus there's lights there's a ligus outbreak in Santa Maria on one of my growers ranch like in February when it was still wet and rainy but it just so happened that right across the fence from him, he had some second year crop that the guy just let go. He just basically let it go and it was a disaster for him. So, so you should all know, just in case you don't, uh, strawberries are a perennial plant. They will grow and produce fruit as long as they're not being uh, frozen or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other places in the world, and even in California in the past, hold strawberries over for a second year. Just uh, we mow them, mow them off and let them regrow and get another season out of them. So there, there were second and even third year strawberries being grown in California. And then slowly that, that uh, practice uh, disappeared because of it, the way it harbors pests between one year and another. You don't get the same fruit quality and production in your second and third year that you do in your first year. So, so slowly it became a sort of perennial plant that's grown as an annual crop. And so at the end of the season when the market is such, they'll just tear up the field and, and disc it up and, and get ready for another crop, whether that be strawberries or some other, some other crop. But, and so it's important to know that, that cultural system, right? It's a, it's a perennial plant grown as an annual. Mm -hmm. And they still, the Northeast still practices. I, I don't know, correct me if I, but the name strawberry, does that come from the matted row straw system? I think it's where it does. Some people say, yeah. Yeah, so they, straw. yeah, in the, in the Northeast, like Vermont, they'll just take bales of straw, throw it over their plants, and let them overwinter that way, rake the straw out in the spring, and, and grow berries. They don't plant every year. So it's kind of unique. So, yeah. Uh, you were talking about the high and low elevation nurseries. I think you mentioned that the 
two of the high elevation ones ship to uh, Florida. Is mm -hmm. there a reason that that's the high elevation ones doing that? Uh, those those specific ones, I don't know why they do that. The, um, both MacArthur and Susanville, those two areas are a little warmer. When we ship to when we ship to um, to Florida, it's it's just the two different growing regions are are impacted. And I don't know why, but. Um, California, we send cut-off plants. You saw what those guys were doing. We we come through the the leaves are chopped off the plants, so it's 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 kind of a dormant plant. Um, when we go to Florida, we leave the tops on the plant. We just lift them out of the field, shake the dirt off, and throw them in the boxes. The leaves are left on, um, so it's a little bit more of a of a green plant transfer, I guess. And I think that by using the MacArthur and the Susanville areas where it's a little warmer. Um, they, that's why they do that. I guess they just don't feel like they need to chill. Uh, we do the same thing out of that McDowell area. We dig and send to Florida as well. Um, there's a nursery in Idaho that's not associated with California that does just Florida, and they've got some of the best uh, plants I've seen in the in the Florida market. And it's just because it's coming out of a really cold. I mean, they'll get frost up there the first of August. So it's just a. You know, there's always it's there's always you know it's one funny thing about both the nursery business and in the fruit growing business. There's all these little production tricks and things that people try to do to try and either gain market share or make sure that they have a consistent supply of fruit or, or what have you. So there's a million ways to manipulate it. Yep. On the subject of diseases, uh, I know that that whole bromide has recently been banned in strawberry mm -hmm. cultivation, but I read somewhere that it's still allowed. That's correct. We operate under what they call a, a quarantine pre-shipment, um, and it's part of a, the idea being that when we export to a lot of countries, that the plants have to be grown in soil that's free from, from nematodes and pests, and the only way you can certify that is for that ground to be fumigated with methyl bromide, so we have an exemption for that for right now. Um, that was all decided under the Mon Montreal Protocol, I think, in 1997. Some other countries have completely gone away from methyl bromide in their nursery production. The United States, as of this time, is not. Go ahead. Well, to that question, um, is that something that you're concerned about, that the United States, that you will not be allowed to use it anymore? And if so, are there any, like, research into alternative methods that you can use to, that would replace methyl bromide? Yes, we're very concerned about it because nothing is as good a fumigate as methyl bromide. The way it travels through the soil and the, and the efficacy it has against diseases, there's nothing like it. Um, there's a great deal of research into other fumigate materials. Um, there's nothing yet that does the job that methyl bromide does. Um, and there's various organic techniques that people are using in anaerobic soil dispestation, which you throw basically throw a protein down, in the case is mostly rice bran, and then you tarp over the top of it, and there's the heat and the microbial action will break down, uh, but it's expensive and, um, and pretty tough to do. And it also comes with, a lot of those techniques, they come with, you're fallowing ground for a while. Um, we fallow for, for one year, so we, we plant ground, we're out for one year, we're back in the next year. Um, if you're doing those production techniques, you gotta lay out for probably a couple, three or four years, plant a cover crop, work with it. You can do it, but it's just, you're gonna pay a lot in rent, so. Good. Uh, you talked a lot about how your job was talking about trying to predict what they want four years from now. Is there any uh, steps like in the industry you guys should take to like, kind of hedge that risk of we're not ideally we could but we're not set up that way I mean ideally I could go to you know a company and say hey what are you gonna want you know what are you gonna want in four years I'm getting laughed at right now because I'm walking into fields asking them what they want next fall let alone four years from now because they're you know they haven't picked a tray yet so what we do is we just like I said we just try and divine and stick our fingers in the wind and and it's it's not as difficult as it sounds you get a pretty good idea of what the growers want um, what varieties they like there's a there's a few out there that you know are oddball varieties that maybe they fill a particular market niche for a particular shipper and so you you ask questions you 
you try and find out, well, you still like the Cabrillo. Is that what you want to do? Does it fit in your program? Well, yeah, we like it. Well, but does it do this? Does it get does it get too dark on you in August and the shippers kick it back? No, this is what we've done to mitigate that. You just have these conversations with them, and it gives you a good idea of what they're what they're trying to do. And you go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And you put some thought behind it versus a guy going, oh yeah, give me a billion, you know, Monterey. Well, I know for a fact that your shipper is going to cut you next year 20% because they don't want to have all the fruit. So you know, you just make all these calculations and you and you hedge it the best you can, just like growing any other commodity. Um, you know, nothing's guaranteed, and um, you know, any sort of contract stuff doesn't. I, it doesn't work real well. You know, it's pretty tough to uphold your end of the bargain on both sides. So, and the cost with it. You know, you're asking growers to, to to lay out money ahead of time, and that's you know, that's pretty tough for them to ask to do when they're they got to meet payroll, they got to pick. You know, everything else. I mean, it, strawberries are incredibly cash, cash intensive crop, and you've got to have cash flow. You know, it's if you don't, it's a it goes south pretty quick because you got fruit that's ready to pick. You can't meet your payroll, and it just it spirals together, and you go broke real fast. So, yep. Sorry for the cheesy question. But sure. What's your average day look like? My average day. It depends on the time of year. Um, this time of year, I'm on the road and on the phone a lot. I had a meeting in Watsonville, I think, on March 3rd, and I've been home for three days since then. Um, down to Oxnard, Baja, um, spent a lot of time in Santa Maria, Watsonville, back to Santa Maria, um, just trying to talk to growers and understand what's going on. Um, Outside of that, um, I spend a lot of time, more time than I like to in the office. Um, I'm, I'm operations bent. I like driving, being out, doing tilling dirt, being in a tractor. That's kind of just my mind, the way I was set up. Um, but it's also, I do a lot of strategic planning and trying to understand and sales. And um, so, you know, it's like I said, it's just highly, I travel a lot. You know, as I indicated, it's, you know, this will be, the summer will be, when we start shipping summer plants to Santa Maria, I'll be down to Santa Maria quite a bit, walking fields with growers. It's probably my favorite thing, is I love walking fields with growers and meeting growers. Um, it's it's a relationship-based business, I think, and it's it's nice to be out knowing that you're doing a good job. At the same time, the nursery business is fraught with peril. It's, things happen to plants, you screw them up, we screw them up. Um, they can be real finicky on storage. These plants, these summer plants, they're gonna be in a cooler for four to six months. Sometimes they die on us in the cooler and sometimes it's our fault. And I gotta go down and talk to a grower and explain to him why it, this field's dying, why he's got 10% of the plants dying. Um, but at the same time, it's nice to go down to a grower and say, you know, and hear them say, you know, I love your plants and they're doing really good and it's really rewarding. So, so I don't, I guess the short answer to your question, which is way too late for that, is that I don't have a typical day. So, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, we had an automation summit for the strawberry industry. And I think everybody's hopeful there will be some tabletop production worldwide. Do you forecast a complete change in genetics, or will it in the future, will it be the same varieties growing for substrate that you're doing varieties now? What does this thing look? I don't know what this thing looks like in October, let alone in five years. And I'm not kidding about. It. I mean, it's 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 pretty interesting right now. We're going through the market's kind of going through an interesting little cycle. Um, we had a kind of a down market. We've lost a lot of acreage. Um, you know, with the labor intensive as labor intensive as strawberries are, if we can't figure out a machine to pick varieties at the field level sometime soon, I think you're gonna see us migrate to a tabletop system similar to what you see in Northern Europe. Um, you know, everybody, the, the, the immigration thing's tough because everybody, you know, we wanna focus on immigration as a policy, right? Well, you know, this, immigra this, this president has this policy and we can't get workers across or, you know, or the other side of the aisle saying, oh, you know, we got all these, you know, illegals here, we need to kick them all out. And, you know, and the ag community is going, oh my God, I just need people to, because we're going broke because we can't get the labor. And the California legislature keeps on jacking up our, 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 um, our rates, our, um, our labor rates. And that's, that's the short term conversation. 
the long-term conversation is that for American agriculture, we've always looked for the Hispanic community coming up from Mexico, legal or Ill illegally, with the H-2A program, which brings, everybody familiar with H-2A? Okay. Well, that's fine. The birth rate in Mexico in 1982 was like 6.7. So for every person, every couple, they had 6.7 kids, right? It's right where we are right now. It's like 2.4. So in 20, 30 years, this idea that we're going to have all of this, this the program and the way we operate now is going to continue, you know, as, as screwed up as it is, is going to continue. It's just not. The people just aren't there. You go to central Mexico right now, and they don't have enough labor. They're, they're bringing in people from down in Oaxaca or from Guatemala and Honduras because their strawberry industry is getting larger. Their raspberry industry is growing. Their auto industry is growing down there. So they don't have any labor. So there's this huge push to automation, not necessarily because of policy, but because the people just aren't flat going to be there, at least as, it's, as we know it now and the model we know it now. Um, we're partners with four other nurseries in an in a, in a automatic, automatic trimming machine. So all that work you saw there with those guys doing, that's all going away, hopefully, for us in a couple of years. We've got a, it's not a robot, but it's, it's a machine that takes visually scanning equipment designed by Carnegie Mellon, picks out the good plants, sends that to, to a conveyor to get packed, and it kicks out the bad plants. Um, every major shipper in California is involved at some level level in an automatic picking machine. Um, and they spent a pile of money trying to figure it out. And depending on who you talk to, yeah, I was at the Automation Summit too. You know, are we two years away or are we 10 years away? That's the big questions everybody's asking. I, I, I think we're closer to five to seven. I don't, it's, there's a lot of stuff they got to figure out. The varieties are going to change because of that. They're looking at doing stem length because a lot of these programs, you got to have the you got to have the fruit hanging over the bed so that the eyes can see it. Well, if you got if it's in the plant, then the, the the machine, the robot can't see it. So they're breeding for a longer stem length so that it can drape over the bed, and then the robot, whether it's a picking hand or whether it's a um, you know whether the pincer wheel or whatever your particular design is, that's able to recognize and pick that strawberry. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. It's probably the last big frontier of, of ag is automating strawberry picking. I mean, I don't know what else is harder. I really don't. Everything else can pretty much be harvested by machine. They're coming, they're pretty close with an apple picker, a trellising system. But again, you're dealing with a nice hard fruit and a, you know, on a plant, a tree that you can kind of control with strawberries. It's this bush that you got to get, you got to keep picking. So it's, the challenges are there for this industry. It's going to be, but we'll, it's it's going to be interesting. It's going to be exciting to see how we fix them, because people are always going to eat strawberries. They're not going to go away. So, anybody else got any questions? Are we? Taking me back out. So yeah. Good session. So. Uh, let's thank Doug for. A yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Gerald, for having me. I really, I enjoyed this. Thank you very much. So. Great to have you. Uh, so. Do you have any questions on anything that we went over uh, before uh, Doug's lecture? Um, come to me after class. Make sure you leave your uh, 